The lesson from the Old Testament for this morning is found in Malachi 4, 5 to 6. It's found on page 692 of the Old Testament in the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. Lo, I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. The lesson from the New Testament for this morning is found in Mark chapter 6, 14 to 29, found on page 31 of the New Testament in the Pew Bibles. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are wor at work in him. But others said, it's Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men to arrest John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodotus, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodotus, had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was righteous and a holy man, and he protected him. When he had heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodotus came in and danced and pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oath and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her, and immediately the king sent a soldier of, of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. And when the girl gave it to her mother, when his disciples heard about it, and they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, when we think better of ourselves, we can think that we follow you well. And we come to passages like this and we are reminded of discipleship that requires more commitment than oftentimes we're willing to give. These are difficult passages and one, words that are not pleasant to our modern sensibilities. Yet be present and instruct us by your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, in our family, there are times where statements are made or you overhear bits of conversations and you just think, that's going to cause a stroke. Statements that you overhear in a restaurant from a booth, words that just fly out that, that out of context just make absolutely no sense. The, the, the common phrase in our family as an example of this is sitting in a restaurant and hearing the words, so if it weren't for the horse, I would have gone to college. And you go, what? What, what does that mean? What, if it wasn't for the horse, I would... And eventually, over and over, the, our, our family saying goes that you just think about it so much that it just causes a stroke one day because you, just, you can't figure out how, if it weren't for this horse, that person would have gone to college. Stories can, when taken out of context, can come in and, and, and just baffle our minds. And yet here we have in Mark a story that comes in that seems like one of those, except it's right there in the middle of the narrative. Last week we were talking about Jesus sending out his disciples on mission. Uh, in, in some ways a training mission, their student teaching if you will, that they were getting some practical experience on what Jesus had been teaching. They've gone out and they are healing people and proclaiming the good news, calling people to repent, and we break to this little story about John the Baptist. Mark, what were you thinking? This doesn't make sense. If, as an English teacher, if I had read this and looked, at the, and looked at the story flow, I would have said, no, no, take this out. It has absolutely no bearing to the plot. But like so many times in an English class when I was teaching literature, the form can often tell us how different stories are to be read. Now, as an example of that, uh, you would never read Shakespeare as a science textbook. You'd never read a sonnet as, as, a, as, as a letter, a to-do list. No, it's, it's art. You have to read it in its own form. And right here, Mark uses a form that's a little bit foreign to us. But the story does fit. And we need to ask here, why? But of course, before we can do that, let's sort out everything that happens in these 15 verses and try to stomach our way through it before lunch. Jesus, in his ministry, as he is sending his disciples out, he was gaining fame to begin with. He was picking up notoriety. Crowds were following him. He almost gets sidetracked at one point on his mission, and he has to refocus. I'm here to preach. His fame is growing in Galilee. And now that the disciples are being sent out and are doing the same work in his name, his fame is growing even more. Such to the point that the scripture tells us that King Herod is taking note of Jesus. He's, he's noticed Jesus. Reports of what Jesus is doing and reports uh, of his fame are reaching even the, the upper political levels in his area. And Herod, along with those in the region of Galilee, are wondering that same question that we have been pondering since chapter 3. Who is this? Who is this? There are some uh, reports that different folks are giving. I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with Elijah. Some people are, are saying, well, this is, this is Elijah. Just like the prophet Malachi said, I'm going to send Elijah to prepare the way. This, this, this is Elijah. Other folks were saying, no, 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 this is, this is one of the prophets, one of the old prophets. This is like Isaiah. This is, this is one who is coming to call us back to God. And yet, some others are saying, no, 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 no. This is John the Baptist. He, he's been brought back to life. 
John the Baptist is alive again. This is, this is his ghost coming to haunt us for what happened. And we find out that, that Herod has this same thought. Because Herod's thoughts are being guided not by kind of anything rational. They're being guided a bit by a guilty conscience. Saying, John has come back from the dead. This is like Marley coming back in a Christmas carol to warn Scrooge. That's what he's thinking. And there's good reason for this. And in verse 17, we begin a bit of a flashback. Who says there are no theatrics in the Bible? Cutscene. We go back a little bit of time and we find out that John had been thrown into prison by Herod. John had been, been captured and put in prison because not just Herod wanted to stop what he was saying, because John was a straight-shooting preacher. He was not sugarcoating anything. And so there were some issues that came up with Herod and his wife that John said, that's not quite okay. And Herod's wife, Herodias, didn't like it. Because Herodias was Herod's half-brother's ex-wife. We're going to get into a little family tree that should fork a little bit more than it does. If you take a look, you can kind of see here, Herodias is the one in yellow up towards the top. Herod the Great, of course, was the king who had called for the execution of all the babies in Bethlehem. And his children, to ten different wives, each got a part of the kingdom. Is this getting confusing yet? Is this soap opera-ish enough? To his first son, Aristobulus, he had a, a granddaughter, Herodias, who married his second son and then divorced her and married his third son. Is this getting strange enough for you? Like I said, the family tree should fork just a little bit more than it should. And John came saying, this isn't right. Not just because of what we would all scientifically term the yuck factor, but because in the Old Testament, this was forbidden. This was forbidden. And John told it that way. Herodias, of course, didn't like John's preaching. And she had in mind to make the problem go away. Permanently. Herodias wanted to kill John. But Herod, Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, Galilee and her husband said, I'm going to protect him. And so he had him thrown into prison a bit to silence him, but a bit as well to, to protect him. Because Herod had this strange relationship with John, as if we haven't had enough strange relationships in the past 30 seconds. Herod found John to be a bit of a curiosity. Herod liked listening to John. But he didn't really understand what he had to say. Herod was confused by John, and yet he liked talking with, he, he felt like he got something stimulating out of him. I suppose it's a bit like listening to a true Scotsman speak. It sounds really interesting, but you have no idea what they're saying. And so Herod would call on John to speak. And it sounded interesting, but he had no idea what he was saying. And he kept John around more like a pet than a prophet. And he wanted to protect John, but after a while, Herod's lifestyle provided an opportunity for Herodias 
to step in. Herod liked luxury, and it was common among non-Jews to have large birthday parties on your birthday. We celebrate, have three in here today, so it's a bit of an appropriate uh, scripture for that. Entirely the work of the Holy Spirit. I did not plan this out. But Herod liked to throw a big birthday party for himself. The, the, the luxury of the Herods was kind of really well known. And so Herod called together a veritable who's who of the upper crust of Galilee. There were, were legal magistrates and there were military commanders and there were economic leading citizens. And he called them all together to his palace and said, we're going to celebrate this one. Herod wasn't exactly a good Jew, even though he was ethnically Jewish. And Herod invited some entertainment for his party. And someone who isn't quite as scrupulous, we can guess that this dance that Herodias' daughter did was not exactly rated PG. Herod and his guests are, are... very, very pleased. And Herod is so pleased that he makes this, this grandiose offer. This great offer about what he's going to do for Herodias' daughter. He says, ask for me anything you want. I'll give it to you. And he promised on oath, I'll give you anything, even up to half of my kingdom. Really? Obviously, Herod had a slight lapse in judgment here on on multiple levels. In the revelry of the party, he's getting a bit excessive. And he doesn't think that someone who's in the royal family anyway, someone who would want for nothing, is going to take him up on half his kingdom. But she goes out and she goes to her mother and says, What? should I ask for? Herodias gets the opportunity dropped right into her lap. Without hesitating says, give me the head of John the Baptist. Herodias' daughter is, is more than happy to oblige. If you notice the scripture, she immediately goes back in. She rushes back in and says, give me the head of John the Baptist at once, immediately. Don't wait and don't wait. Don't wait for the guests to clear out and then go back on it and say, sorry, not doing it. I want it right now. And by the way, serve it up on a platter. The revelry and spirit or spirits of the evening quickly sober up. Herod is conflicted. And scripture tells us he's experiencing deep grief in this moment. He realizes what's been asked for. And yet because of the oath he makes and because of the dinner guests there, I don't feel like I can back out of this. A moment of principle that outweighs the life of John. He has deep grief and on the other hand, he has the desire to save face. And eventually the desire to save face wins and John loses his head. And unlike Herod, John's disciples show a little dignity. They come and they take his body and they appropriately bury it. The excitement, the festivity gets sucked out of the room and out of the story. And with that, this strange little story ends. We have to ask ourselves, Mark, why is this here? What is the the, the purpose of this gruesome story then it interrupts the disciples' mission. Like I said, 
uh, in English as we're interpreting different uh, pieces of literature, form often comes into play. And right here, what we have is a certain form. A sandwich, if you will. A sandwich at the banquet. Because this story comes in the middle of the disciples' mission. The disciples were working on their mission in verse 13, and at right after in verse 29, the end of this story, they come back to Jesus finishing their mission. And when Mark do does this, he does this several times. We did it back in chapter 5 with a couple of healings. When Mark does this, the story on the inside of that sandwich is meant to illustrate the story on the outsides. And what we see is the disciples' mission, their, their task of going out. If you recall the last week, if, you, if you've read the story of Jesus sending the apostles out, what did he tell them about how they're to go? Don't take a second staff, don't take food, don't take a second tunic. By the way, don't even take spare change. And when you get somewhere, don't start looking for a better house. The disciples are, are, are told to give up some of their comforts and some of their possessions for the mission. Because Jesus wants them to rely on God and to understand what discipleship really is. The mission cost them some comforts and some amenities if they want to be faithful to Jesus' instructions and Jesus' call. And here, John's adherence to God's call on his life costs him far more than some creature comforts and some spare change. His call to righteousness, to holiness, and to be a prophetic voice costs him his entire life. Mark illustrates the disciples, the apostles' discipleship by John's sacrifice. And it begs the question for us, what are we willing to give up in our discipleship? Because if last week's story made us uncomfortable about giving up some bread for the road and, and our second tunic, of course, which I promptly gave away, how much more does this story assault our sensibilities and assault our comfort? What are we willing to give up? John preached truth even at the risk of his own life. Speaking out against the political leaders of the day was risky business to begin with, and even more so when the, both the husband and wife team are formidable in their own right. What will we give up? What is God calling us to and what does that require of us? It's an important question that we have to ask when we see this. Of course, we know that John's discipleship here is going to foreshadow Jesus's. And these two alone stand as the greatest examples of discipleship in Mark. But even the relationship between Herod and John can show us a danger as well when it comes to faith. Herod liked to keep John around, like I said, more as a pet than a prophet because he was a curiosity and strangely entertaining, like I said, like a Scotsman speaking in full speed. It's just cool even though you don't know what they're saying. He liked to look at John. He liked most of the things that John had to say even if he didn't understand a good bit of it. And the things that he didn't like about John, he felt he had the power to just dismiss and disregard. In part, I'm sure he felt this way because of his position of power there in Galilee. And it's funny because he gave protection to John in his situation. And perhaps some of this, uh, kind of liking John as a curiosity and liking some of the things he has to say, but really I'm going to dismiss some of those things that are uncomfortable. Sometimes that can sound a bit like our relationship 
with Jesus, can it? Jesus, I, I really love that whole love your neighbor thing. Except when they tick me off and then that's why the fence is there. I, I really like what you have to say about giving to the poor except really when it cuts into my budget too much and I can't afford the, the regular entertainment that I like. You know, I really like what you have to say about relationships until it makes mine uncomfortable. Sometimes we can like to look at Jesus. He's a bit of a curiosity, and let's face it, some of the things he says we just don't quite understand, do we? We read the Bible and we say, I know what all those words individually mean, and I have no idea what they mean altogether. And so our relationship with Jesus and with God looks a bit like Herod's relationship with John. A curious, entertaining attraction. And if that is sounding strangely familiar, then the scripture challenges us here to evaluate our relationship, to evaluate our discipleship. Are we there because it's interesting? Or are we there because we are embracing, embracing the good news, embracing the call to repentance, embracing the coming kingdom of God? and the redemption that comes with it. Price of faithful discipleship can be ultimate. It can be. And it requires more than a curious attention to our faith. This scripture stands as a reminder that we should examine our own hearts, examine our own relationship with our Lord. And if we're wavering on God's call on our life, to step back, to look, and to embrace that call to its fullest. To embrace the life of discipleship and carry it into the world. By God's grace, we can do this. Let's pray. Lord, seal your word into our hearts. Become for us more than just a curious attraction, Jesus. Open our eyes to who you are so that when we ask the question, who is this, we respond, my Lord and my God. Send your spirit to help us live out these verses in our life to seek to bring others to know you. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen.